Thank you. So everybody can see my screen, right? I think you can. Well, welcome, welcome. I am thrilled to be back. It was wonderful to be invited. I kind of figure since uh, I was invited the first time was successful. So I remember watching Jerry Seinfeld. He was doing a stand-up set a while back and he said, there was a survey that said the average person's greatest fear is having to give a speech in public. And somehow this ranked even higher than death. Death was like third on the list. So you're telling me that at a funeral, most people would rather be in the coffin than have to stand up and give the eulogy. Why is that? Why are most people afraid of being judged by others rather than speaking with the Grim Reaper? So this is my talk. It's the secret thoughts of a successful hacker. We're gonna explore imposter syndrome and pluralistic ignorance in pen testing. And that's something that started for me probably about you know 20 years ago when I started in IT, and it's something I still struggle with today. So I have two little ones. I have a little bit of a delay there. Very cool. And they're not quite this little anymore. My daughter is artistic, creative. She's a painter. She's a singer. And then there's my son. And my son is the thinker. He is the questioner. And he always wants to know who's going to win. And so this makes for great table, dinner table conversation. So the past couple of debates that we've had at the dinner table was who would win? King Kong or Godzilla? <laughs> now, I know we have the Discord server and you guys can have fun with that. Uh, that's okay. King Kong or Godzilla? We had another conversation not too terribly long ago. Who would win? Jean Grey or the Scarlet Witch? And most of the time, hands down, it's Jean Grey. Now, our most amusing debate of all time actually happened about a year ago because Halloween. I'm on the right <laughs> and daddy's on the left. It does. It makes for a very interesting dinner conversation. You know, when your husband's the CCMP and you're the CISSP at the dinner table, my poor kids. Anyway. If you tell my son to do something, he wants to know why, and he hears a new word, and he'll ask you what it means. They're both in virtual school, and, and I hear him sometimes asking questions, and I'm thinking, oh, crap, what is he going to ask now? And it's going to be a doozy of a question when he says, can I ask you something? And what that usually means is that he's already put some thought into the question, he already kind of knows what he thinks your answer might be. I think he's going to make an amazing social engineer one day. So Chris had Nagy, my 12 year old's coming for you. I don't remember exactly where we were. We were in the FJ, but a few years ago, he was in the back seat and he said, mom, can I ask you a question? Oh crap. If smart people know they're smart, do dumb people know they're dumb? And so first laughter, initial surprise. And then what I try to do as a parent is I turn it around, you know, that Socratic method of parenting, otherwise known as the, I have no idea how to answer that parenting method. And so I did, I said, Gavin, do smart people really know they're smart? What makes a smart person smart? Do you think you're smart? And then I opened up a can of worms. Do you think I'm smart? So believe it or not, many smart people don't think that they are. And so we still talk about this today. Smart people know there is so much more to know. You learn something new and it opens another door and another door and another door. So if you've never heard of the imposter syndrome, this is the classical definition. It's a really interesting phenomenon that a lot of smart people overachieving successful hackers have. It's a concept describing individuals who are marked by the inability to internalize their accomplishments and a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud, as being found out. If you've ever internalized these questions or these thoughts, such as, 
What if they find out I'm not as smart as I think I am? Or they think I am? I can't pull this hack off. Who am I kidding? This exploit will never work. Lucky me. I was in the right place at the right time. If I can do it, anyone can do it. That one's me. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And that's not coming from a place of arrogance. It's a genuine feeling that anybody can do what I do. So John Strand asked me to present, Velda asked me to present at the Wild West Hacking Fest and share the same track with David Kennedy, Jonathan Hamm, Doc Blackburn. And honestly, my gut reaction was whiskey, tango, foxtrot. <laughs> no. What on earth would I say to a Wild West Hacking Fest audience? I've been in that audience, but I've been a huge fan of Velda's and John's for years. So outside the box, I did it. This is what we're going to talk about. What is it? Who has it? When does it happen? Where do you go to get help? And how to get rid of it? So numbers, if you need a few numbers, this is 89% of 100 people, so 89 out of 100, say that imposter syndrome affects their performance. According to the International Journal of Behavioral Science, Studies suggest that more than 70% of people experience imposter syndrome at some point in the career, no matter what career they're in. The next time you're in a room of 100 people, you can figure about two. Two people have never had this level of anxiety. And so these are some of the symptoms of imposter syndrome. Extreme lack of self-confidence, feelings of inadequacy, consistently comparing yourself to other people, other hackers, self-doubt, distrust in your own intuition and capability. I think everybody knows who this is. Believe it or not, Albert Einstein, recognized as one of the most influential scientists of the past 500 years, had a case of imposter syndrome. He confided to a close friend, and I quote, the exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. And none of us think of Einstein as a fraud, but he felt insecure about his talents and his achievements, as do many of us. I got to meet Maya in high school, the civil rights activist, author, poet, Nobel laureate, admitted at times she felt like a fraud, once saying, I have written 11 books. Each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find me out. I've run a game on everybody, and they're going to find me out. Now, if there are any Harry Potter fans, yep. Harry Potter actress Emma Watson has publicly admitted to falling into the trap of imposter syndrome. There was an interview that she did with Vogue magazine. And she shared how she feels when people praise her for her acting. And she says, when I receive recognition for my acting, I feel incredibly uncomfortable. I feel like a imposter. Now, one of my favorite actors in Deadpool, not Green Lantern, <laughs> Ryan Rills has said, to be honest, I still feel like a freckle faced kid faking it until I make it. Guys, Deadpool has imposter syndrome. Now, you might not recognize the next person that I have in my slide deck. This is doc Dr. Margaret Chan, and Forbes once ranked her the 30th most powerful woman in the world. She finished two terms as the head of WHO, the World Health Organization, and you would think somebody with her educational background, decades of medical experience, that it would make her feel like an expert in her field. Again, a direct quote. There are an awful lot of people who think I'm an expert. How do these people believe this about me? I am so aware of all the things I don't know. And guys, that my friends, 
I think is the key to imposter syndrome. It's quite normal. It's arrogant to think that you know it all. There are a few hackers I know that think they do, but good ones, there are so, there's so much more out there to know. You open a door or a back door, and there's so much in the world left to explore and learn from. So while I was presenting, uh, uh, thinking about this talk, this popped up on my uh, LinkedIn page. And Caleb is a friend of mine from LinkedIn, and he had no idea I was doing this talk. He's a director at a company. You probably have the software on your machine. But he says, imposter syndrome, when you work in tech, everybody has it. Nobody talks about it. You're supposed to be the smartest person in the room. You're the software engineer genius, and you should know it all, right? Here's the truth. We were all imposters at some point. No matter how skilled or expert you are today, you were once a noob too. Stop pretending you know it all. Raise your hand. Ask the question and embrace the fact that tech is a constant flux of learning. So thank you, Caleb. I appreciate you letting me quote you. When you start thinking about imposter syndrome, there are different flavors, if you will. Oh my gosh, I missed a slide. Let me go back. Because we can't go without our ice cream. There are different flavors of imposter syndrome. And imposters don't experience failure the same way. We're all very different people. And the reason is you don't necessarily define competence in the same way. So have you ever worked with the perfectionist? The perfectionist's primary focus is on how something is done. And sometimes for this kind of imposter, one minor flaw in an otherwise stellar pen test, 99 out of 100, that's failure. And thus they feel the shame. The expert, that's the person who is at the knowledge version of the perfectionist because you expect to know everything. And even that minor lack of knowledge denotes failure and shame. I've been a technical instructor for 20 years now, over 20 years. I've taught you know, college and university at LSU. I've taught for the DOD. I think one of my strongest strengths <laughs> is that I'm not afraid to tell you I don't know. There are things I don't know. And I'm not going to BS you. I'm not going to try to make something up. I don't know it all. I'll go find it and I'll come share. But there's nothing wrong with saying I don't know. What about the soloist? The soloist cares mostly about the who. Who finishes it? Who completes the task? It needs to be them and them alone. I know that you've worked with that. I mean, if you've ever worked on a group project, you know what that feels like. You think you need to do it all. You have to figure it out on your own. And if you need help, you're a failure. Now, I've got a quote for you. So I, I don't think Melda knew I was going to do this. But whomever in Discord chat can tell me who this, who said this, I'll autograph a book and send it to you. You know, private chat Velda your um, address. So I'll autograph a book for you, send it to you. Who said this? There is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. Does anybody know? It was Reagan. Again, autographed copy of my newest book to the first person who said that in chat. I am the multitasker. I have a lot of friends and maybe it's just part of my nature who bases competence on how many things I can do at once, both as a parent, a partner, work, as a host or hostess, friend, volunteer. I want to do it all and I want to do it perfectly and I want it to be seamless and easy. So we do have different types. So there is a point in your career Pretty much everybody experiences self-doubt. No matter how smart, no matter how awesome you are, 
There have been times in my life I have not felt good enough, an imposter. Sometimes it'll come in waves, washes over me. No matter what I do, I'm not going to be good enough. And when I look around, I see people who are smarter, richer, funnier, kinder, stronger, prettier, more dedicated. And then we have some of those that uh, drive DeLoreans, <laughs> David. But not many type faster. I do type really fast. Ah. So who am I? I've worked in IT for over 20 years. I've been help desk. I've been an IT director. I have taught certification classes at the Pentagon, um, escorted to the bathroom by a man who had a very large gun and did not smile. Um, I've taught multiple times for uh, Fortune 50 companies at the World Trade Center who specifically asked for me to come back and teach those classes. I've taught cybersecurity to the NYPD. I've taught on multiple continents and I do hold about 30 certifications. And I'm proud of that alphabet soup. There was uh, a time that uh, I was working for an organization and we were having difficulties with a customer. My CISO said, um, I want you to put every certification in your signature block. It made for a very big signature block, but we didn't get a single question after that. And the contract went through, no problem. I think out of everything that I've taught, the Metasploit class that I taught for Rapid7 was probably my favorite, absolutely my favorite. And again, I work for Mandiant, I work for FireEye, I work for people, state of the art, latest and greatest intelligence. But again, that Metasploit class, there's nothing like, you know, teaching somebody how to drop a interpreter shell for the first time pwn a box, you know, steal all the creds, drop a key logger and have them, you know, giggle with joy because it's so cool. I'm a Jane of all trades and actually I'm a master of nothing. I am the author of two books and that's another story that I can tell you. But one of them, the cybersecurity blue team toolkit was an act of love. It was, they'd actually asked me to write a book on Metasploit and I worked for Rapid7. H.G. Moore was our uh, chief research officer. I have sat at the table with Egypt, with James Lee and Brent Cook and uh, Sam Huckins. And I'm not writing that book. I've got David Kennedy's book behind me. I'm not writing that book. And they came back and they asked me, what book would you write? And I was like, okay, what book did I need 20 years ago? There is nothing like walking into Barnes & Noble and pulling your book off the shelf and signing it and putting it back. So the cybersecurity blue team toolkit actually has a 4.6 rating on Amazon. And I'm so proud of that. But in the back of my mind, there is one review from Mr. John Carroll in the UK who gave me one star. And it niggles, you know, it's back there in my mind that there's somebody out there that thought my book that was you know, something created out of love for the industry and for the people who were coming behind me, you only gave me one star. Kind of hurts my feelings. The current uh, project that I'm working on is uh, I'm the technical editor for Mike Chappell and David Seidel's CompTIA Security Plus, the 601 book. And <laughs> that's me. That's the lifeguard because Right now, I've technically edited the whole book. We're reviewing flashcards and the glossary now. And the biggest mistake I found was there was a, a third party URL that aired out as a 404. And yeah, there was a question that was misnumbered. So talk about imposter syndrome when you are working with the best of the best. So it does help to have friends. It does help to have friends in the industry who will technically edit your book. These are two of my best friends that I absolutely have on that pedestal, absolutely brilliant. But isn't it ironic that the people that have imposter syndrome, those feelings of self-doubt is particularly difficult for high achievers. And honestly, I would bet most of you who have taken time out of your day to attend a non-techie talk, yeah, you're in that club. 
So I did. I spoke to people who I hold in high esteem. In fact, a CISO friend of mine who said that he would be in my original talk. So Ian, yep, uh, I'm quoting you here. He says that some of the CISOs, some of the CISOs that he knows are worried that he, they're going to be found out. And another friend of mine who you probably have her book on your shelf at this Black Hat, actually. She was afraid nobody was going to show up, that nobody was going to come and get her book. And the line was wrapped around the Carbon Black booth twice. And yeah, just absolutely crazy. Same Black Hat. I was staying at Mandalay Bay, of course. And, well, not of course, but I was staying at Mandalay Bay. And I was coming down the elevator. It was just me and this other guy, this really tall guy. And he was so cool. You know, we talked about beer and we talked about his favorite books and my favorite martini. And he was headed to his book signing. And I told him where I'd had my book signing and I didn't know where he was supposed to go. And he said, it's not going to take too long. He really doubted anybody would be there. What party was I going to later? And so, you know, that hike from Mandalay Bay through the casino, up through the restaurants, and then turn to the left. And then you go up the thingy and then around and then up the escalator. And when we walked into the ballroom, yeah, I had ridden up the, esc the, the down the elevator with uh, Luke Benfrey, death veggie himself. So... I have several times thought about tearing this out of the book that he autographed for me and uh, just framing it as a reminder of um, accomplishments that I've made. I am worthy. I did do it. You know, all those things that, uh, yeah, I almost framed it. So some humility is good. It kind of guards you against getting that big head. And I know you know those people too. But one of the biggest takeaways, if you do sign off now, you're not alone. You are not alone. You might think you are, but you're not. So now I want you to participate. Let's pretend that you're in class. This kind of looks like one of the auditoriums I taught in at LSU. What is pluralistic ignorance? Pluralistic ignorance happens when people infer that they feel differently from their peers even though you're doing the exact same thing. You're behaving the same way. So you're in this large lecture hall, and let's pretend that Lenny Zelter is teaching a class on malware analysis. And I've sat that class. And if you ever get to take a class with Lenny, it is like poetry in motion, highly recommended, brilliant, absolutely one of the smartest people I have ever met in my life. So anyway, he's talking, he's talking, and you're starting to get lost. After a few minutes, you're really lost. And so Lenny pauses the class and he says, does anybody have any questions? And no hands go up. You look around the room and you're lost. But you think to yourself, these people understand how this works. I don't. Your fear of looking dumb, if you will, keeps you from raising your hand. You interpret the other students sitting around you as having a reason that they're behaving the same as you, and you take their failure as a sign that they understand. Odds are, somebody genuinely has questions. But again, these different assumptions you make about the cause of your behavior and the cause of their behavior that is pluralistic ignorance. And so those of us who experience this sometimes, you feel less knowledgeable, usually a little bit more uptight. Sometimes, you know, you feel less committed. Maybe it's a fellow employer, maybe less competent than a fellow hacker. And this leaves you feeling bad about yourself, alienated from the group or the tribe or the institution that you're a part of. Now, how do you alleviate pluralistic ignorance? through sitting a talk like this and realizing this is normal, this is natural. And I would bet money, and I don't bet money, I used to deal craps way back in the day. I know what the odds are. Somebody in this audience has the exact same question and they're afraid to ask it too. When you're experiencing imposter syndrome and that's coupled with pluralistic ignorance, 
not only do you feel like you're a fraud in your own right, but everybody else is smarter than you. And that is a double whammy. So speaking of education, imposter syndrome and pluralistic ignorance, yep, guess what? Lenny Zeltzer has imposter syndrome too. And he's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. So when you start looking at education, which is primarily what I do, let's talk about competence and self-awareness. There are four stages. So where are you in this? This was suggested by Noel Birch in the 1970s. And I really do love this model as an educator because it can be applied to just about anything. Sports, philosophy, cybersecurity, hacking, no matter what. At that very first stage, you have unconscious incompetence. Basically, let's just say that you're very bad at hacking. Um, you suck, <laughs> but you don't know why you suck. You're a little ignorant. You look at the little blinky light. And you don't know what that means. But after you have a mentor, after you take you know a couple of dozen classes, maybe some LinkedIn learnings, maybe some Udemy, you start being aware of your own skill level. You see yourself now on this spectrum of learning. This is conscious incompetence. In other words, now you know why you suck. So then you practice and you practice and a little you know, more mentorship and a lot more classes. Now you're moving up to conscious competence and now you're getting better. And not only that, you know why you're better. You know the journey that it took you to get here. More practice and experimenting. Maybe you're even developing your own style, your own way of writing scripts, your own way of hacking becomes second nature. You've got this core set of skills, the way you write an exploit or the way you social engineer the receptionist to let you in the comm closet. These are now natural. You don't even have to think about them, but there is a danger when you do get to that uncompetent, that unconscious competence and that's complacency. Nothing moves as fast as cybersecurity. Nothing moves as fast as this industry. My best friend is a physician. She taught at Vanderbilt. She's a pathologist. And over a glass of wine, a couple of Christmases ago, we had this debate. My industry is harder than yours. She's a doctor. No, it's not. Yes, it is. When you went to, a med, to med school and you looked under a microscope, a cell was a cell was a cell. How often are, do you have these world-shaking zero days that hit? For me, every other week. So our industry changes so quickly and so dynamically. So again, that last stage there, there is that danger of complacency, and especially in our industry, we can't. Now, I do have a personal opinion, and this is just you know Nadine's opinion, about expertise. You will never, ever see me add expert after my name. I do see on LinkedIn some people put expert after their name. But those people that I consider to be the expert, like the John Strands in the world, they are humble as pie. My grandma used to say, being rich is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you're not. And I feel the same way about our industry. If you tell me that you're an expert, oh, that's going to be my first doubt. So think about where you are. Think about what it is that you do. Where are you on this chart of competence? Because we're always learning. We're always growing. All right. So how do you manage this? How do you manage your own self-doubt? We know that success is a matter of repetition. So let me ask you this question. Who was the best, is the best basketball player of all time? All right, so I am a little older than probably <laughs> most or some of you in here. For me, it's Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan had a goal. Every single day, he made 100 free throws in a row. If he missed on 99, he started over. What he knew about the way his brain works, the brain shapes itself based on repetitive thoughts and behaviors. Words play a key role in how you convey your thoughts to yourself as well as others. Again, as a social engineer, 
the words that you use, the way you describe yourself, it tells me a lot about your mind, your character, and where you're going in life. Just by paying attention to what you say, I get this understanding of who you are. So the words that you think and the words that you speak do have a direct correlation. So I was at the Hacker Halted conference year before last. Yeah. And Deidre Diamond from uh, Cyber SN, she was one of the keynote speakers. She and uh, Chris Roberts, another friend that lives here in Denver. And I love Deidre. She gave us a couple of words to actually remove from our vocabulary, and I added a couple. So if you have a pen, I would like you to write these down, and I want you to make a point of recognizing when you use them and try not to. Try to use a different vernacular with yourself. All right. The first one I want you to remove is obviously. I don't believe that there's any way you can say this word and not sound like a jerk. Obviously, it's so condescending. Try it. I'll wait. Obviously, you, I, them aren't good enough. So that's a word I want you to remove from your vocabulary. The next word, but. How many times do you but yourself? Yeah, but. Okay, but. Stop it. When you use this word with others, it means that you're everything but okay. With someone else's point of view, either you don't deem it valuable, you haven't paid attention. This is a big problem that we have in our industry. We listen to reply, not to understand. So how often do you but yourself? And think about it. Won't the conversation be better with yourself if you use the word and instead? Exchange but for and. Watch what happens. I wish I could and instead of I wish I could but. And see how you feel about yourself. You're not an imposter and is going to open up new worlds for you. The next word I think we should <clears throat> never use <laughs> <laughs> is never, never say never. Not only for Murphy's Law, because the minute you say never, you know it's going to happen. But I mean, literally, it reduces trust. It reduces motivation. It reduces energy. Replace never with possibilities, which means that you should remove the word impossible. This is one of the most common ones. You always point out how something can't be done rather than Finding a way to do it. Impossible can actually harm you, your organization, and ultimately your life. Indulging in it will never bring you that peace of mind. I would hate to go to my grave with the regrets, thinking something was impossible when I really, really wanted to do it. Honestly, you become a better hacker. Just remove this from your vernacular. Erase it from your vocabulary. The next word that you should never ever use is try. Well, and the reason being, Yoda told us to. <laughs> we all love Yoda. Do or do not, there is no try. What does that mean? You don't ever try to do something, please just don't try. You either do it or you don't. You commit or you surrender. There is no in-between. Trying means that you mentally are giving too much space to the possibility of failure. Perhaps your thoughts are centered around the fact that nothing might work out in the end. Then you feel stuck. And guess what? You feel like an imposter. So these are now your curse words. And... Uh, one of the things that I did after Deidre's talk was I got a jar. And every time I thought that word, every time it came out of my mouth, I put a dollar in the jar. And hopefully when COVID lists, lifts, you know, I'm going to Hawaii with the proceeds. That's a vacation that we have planned. And that's where it's being funded. So you know people like this. I've known people like this. I actually had a next door neighbor that did this. 
You've worked on your vocabulary. We've worked on your mindset. You're now planning a vacation. But self-doubt will manifest itself in other ways as well. I had a boss, guys. She gave me a script. I was delivering a five-minute update to a sales team on my project. I am a published author. I'm a college professor. And she gave me a script complete with dad jokes, complete with the jokes. that. And I, I really, up until that point, really respected this boss. And I really started doubting myself. I thought, am I too technical? Was it not technical enough? Am I too verbose? Was she afraid I was going to talk too long? You might dread, you know, a meeting or a gig that's coming up convinced you're not going to pull off this pen test. You're not going to pull off this presentation. You might get the feeling that, you know, you're talking in front of people and it's landing, you know, with a thud. You know, when you expect the, the jokes to generate laughter and silence, there's nothing like that. <laughs> I've done that, but yeah, it, it's disheartening. So you walk away, you get out of a meeting or I've done this. Have you ever walked out of a job interview? And the minute you're out the door, you think of like 10 better answers that you could have given rather than the one that you actually did. If you know Jimmy Alley, he's from Lost Rabbit. He says, we need constant sanity checks from each other. And so us as high achievers, we do have this perfectionist streak. We want to act with 100% certainty, especially in new situations. Guys. That's not good, especially in new situations where you perceive that you might misstep. And then what do you do? You hold back. You hold back rather than jumping in. Or have you ever stayed in a job or a relationship or some kind of situation that was toxic because you were afraid of what was outside? Do you overthink things waiting for that perfect answer? Oh, man, I've done that. Come up with that perfect answer. And then the moment's gone. So again, operate, don't operate as every interaction that you take is high stakes. Really making those small calculated risks could have a huge upside. So what I want you to put on your goals, I'm a huge goal setter. Your goals coming up for the next week or the next month. I want you to look for examples in your tribe of individuals who have taken stretch assignments. It's a task that is beyond your current knowledge or beyond your current skill set. Stretch yourself developmentally. And the stretch assignment, again, is a challenge. By putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation, guess what happens on the other side? You learn and you grow. For me, this kind of talk is a stretch assignment. I can deliver a technical class in a heartbeat. I'm talking about the way I feel about something, the way I think about something other than binary bits and bytes and terabytes and petabytes and brontobytes. So I want you to be the person who steps in at the last minute, covers for a colleague. You might see a entirely new world that you think, oh, I'm adept at this. This is fun. You're also showing leaders how you apply your strengths to new challenges. So again, you might think of people in your life as being fearless. In reality, many of us feel the fear and deliver the talk anyway. If you hold yourself to a higher standard and as a result, you don't pursue any bigger opportunities, you could get left behind. It is okay not to know everything. And honestly, when you start that new role, you start that new job and there's that huge learning curve as somebody who's studying for OSCP rather than hiding thinking of yourself as an amateur as long as you're enthusiastic about the learning process most people if not all people are going to cut you some slack and lastly I want you to be a superman superwoman I want you to think about the people in your life that have been a mentor Become like them. Become a mentor. Teach, lecture, 
volunteer, and next month present something that you're most passionate about. And I promise you, you'll be surprised at just how much you know. As we become experts in our own areas, guys, it gets amplified. It becomes amplified when you're dealing with the true newbie. It, gains, it helps us gain perspective on our success. Remind yourself how far you've come. And again, it's okay not to know everything. It's okay not to be perfect. And a tiny bit of imposter syndrome keeps you real. So you do have homework. <laughs> Remove those toxic words from your vocabulary. It's obvious you should do that. Let go of being that perfectionist. Take some risks. Stretch. Track your successes. And lastly, I would like you to have a mentor. If you don't have one, you're in the Discord server. Talk about your mentors. Say that you need a mentor. And for those of us who have been around for a while, be a mentor. So someone else with imposter syndrome, I think this is some good advice. You can't be that kid standing at the top of the water slide overthinking it. You have to go down the chute. You have to let people see what you wrote. It will never be perfect, but perfect is overrated. So thank you for having me back, Velda, for making me do this again. <laughs> it's been a joy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, TV. Pardon me. I, I love this talk so much, and I think it resonates with so many. Deb and I were on, the, on our Jabber talking about how, how, how it, it resonates with me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yes. matter the industry. I think it resonates with everybody. Yeah, it's definitely a universal thing. Um, and that's why I think it's so great that you talk about it. And everyone, it really is that like, oh, me too. Like everyone has a moment where they feel like they can't do the thing uh, daily. Uh, and we have a couple questions, a couple comments from the Discord, from the GoToWebinar. Uh, one is a good one. What happens when you ignore imposter syndrome? And for this person said that when with me, it became a huge, like became bigger, like huge beyond description, he said. So, yeah, I, I can see that happening, especially if you're unaware that it actually is a thing. I think mm -hmm. awareness and education is probably most important. Sharing mm -hmm. the fact that you feel that with trusted mentors, if you will, trusted friends, you know, I'm able to, you know, right before this, I went outside and I told Kenneth, you know, my husband, oh my gosh, there are 800 people who signed up for this. I can't do this. And he was like, of course you can. And then I was like, you're right. Of course I can. So I came back in and delivered it. I think awareness that it's part of who you are. And again, realizing that it is normal. It's part of the human psyche and we're human. So, you know, again, just being aware is huge. Mm -hmm. um, Extreme Paperclip, one of our, our big fans uh, said, if you ever feel like you're not good enough or smart enough in your career, remember the Wright brothers, they were bicycle technicians. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. If I ever have to deliver this, th this talk again, I'll include that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Any other questions, Velda, that you saw? I didn't. I haven't been monitoring. I've been so enthralled with the, the talk <laughs> itself. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't uh, say anything. Um, did just... If you have some, please put them in the, the Discord. Mm -hmm. We'll certainly be happy to ask. Yeah, just so much thanks, Nadine. Uh, that's him. Officer says, thanks for being the person in the crowd, not afraid to raise your hand. <laughs> uh one of the best talks they've attended yes also true we, we all need that encouragement we all need a cheerleader um we need to be that for each other uh so you are leading the way in that so thank you so much for that i appreciate that i really really do i really do and now i can feel good for the rest of the day exactly <laughs> <laughs> so so when you left before we went live that's where you went you went outside and you were like hey, hey, people. <laughs> My husband was on the couch. I was like, oh my gosh. And uh, yeah, so 
Mm-hmm. Super cool. Thank you for making me stretch, Velda, for, for making me think about something that, you know, I don't normally pay a lot of attention to and then realize that it's not just me. It isn't mm-hmm. just me. It's mm-hmm. not just you. It is. And it's it's good to know that it's not just me, right? I mean, it's it's... I've had it for a long time, right? So mm-hmm. it's and, good to know that I'm not the only one. Mm-hmm. And I think and it, sometimes that helps. Mm-hmm. And it, it does get easier over time, but once in a while, it'll just hit you out of nowhere. But the more, like you said, the more you put yourself out there, the more you give the talk, the more you breathe and you just, you give the presentation anyway, it, it becomes easier. Until it doesn't. <laughs> but again, you don't want to get to that complacency part. You don't mm-hmm. want to get to that to that time that you think, oh, well, I do know everything when mm-hmm. no, no, mm-hmm. we don't. Mm-hmm. Constantly learning. Yes. I love your reminder that some of the people that we have on the pedestals, especially in this industry, are some of the most humble people you will ever meet. No, I know. And it's hard not mm-hmm. to adore them for that, for that mm-hmm. humbleness. Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, absolutely absolutely um any more okay here's a good question uh what if you don't want to be noticed (laughs) i'm married to a person that feels that way that's okay it's part of his personality he is the introvert i am the extrovert Mm -hmm. but again that self-awareness is always always going to be good and if you don't want to be noticed, that's fine. That's part of who you are. But as long, one of the things that I think attracted me so much to Kenneth when we were dating is that, and this, is, this sums him up in a quote, he does not take advice. No, he does not take criticism from anyone he does not take advice from. And so he is so self-assured. He doesn't feel the need to be noticed. He is Mm -hmm. fairly self-contained. We do tease him about, you know, being able to live on a desert island by himself. But Mm -hmm. yeah, that type of self-confidence, self-awareness, there's nothing wrong with that. That's who you Mm -hmm. are. And accept that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Another question, uh, we talked about this. uh, What is the opposite of imposter syndrome? Overconfidence. How do you overcome (laughs) that? I do some oh. humble themselves. <laughs> now, my PhD is not in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I think, and again, this is just Nadine's opinion, that we are motivated from fear or pleasure. And a lot of the people that I have, I have worked with, again, in, in my 20 plus years, whenever I see that overconfidence, Normally, it's not a real overconfidence. Normally, it's a facade. It Mm -hmm. is they are afraid of the failure. They just compensate for it maybe a little bit differently. Sometimes. Now, there are Mm -hmm. mental illnesses. (laughs) We all know that, you know, there are people that don't. That don't have that ability to see where they can be wrong. You know, Mm -hmm. there's narcissism and there's. There's lots Mm -hmm. of different things that can affect people. But most of the time, when I see that overconfidence, it's because they're afraid of of looking incompetent. Mm -hmm. So they overcompensate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely common. And Spawn, you wants to know what's the toughest exam or test you have ever taken? CASP. (laughs) Hands down. So CISSP for me, was a do or die. I was working at Fort Carson at Iron Horse University. I was teaching certification classes for Peterson, Shriver, you know, the Air Force, you know, just all over Colorado Springs. And the guy who had taught CISSP left. And I had been teaching A plus, Net plus, Security plus, Server plus for about a year. And my commandant, in fact, the guy that was in my picture, he's now the trainer, uh, manager of training at Carbon Black, Ryan. Ryan Hendricks told me, you've got a month. You've got 30 days. We've got CISSP on the schedule and you're teaching it. And it's like, (laughs) wow. So I had a month to study for CISSP, but compared to CASP, I think I was in the beta for CASP. 
but I have not taken OSCP yet. So that 24 hour exam for me is a little daunting. Okay, it's a lot daunting, but I have been told by people that have it, you're almost ready. You, you're, you're doing good, keep going. You know, I have that uh, momentum and I have that support behind me and, and I've got people I can reach out and ask questions to, but as of today's date and then writing the CASP book, holy moly, that, that was difficult. 1,000 different scenario-based questions with answers. I don't know if I ever want to do that again. <laughs> I said yes, not knowing how hard that was going to be. <laughs> how many of us can relate with that? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, goodness. Um, well, you brought up mentors, and um, you mentioned the Discord. Discord is a great place for mentors looking for mentees and vice versa. We do have a channel in the Black Hills server that you could go and just say, hey, this is who I'm looking for. This is who I'm looking for to mentor, too. So that's a great resource. That's that a lot of you have already posted in there. So I encourage you guys to check that out. Definitely. Um, and with that, if we don't have anything else, Velda, anything? Um, I, I think we're good. Nadine, thank you again for doing this, this talk. Thanks for being a mentor, me. And uh, we will see you at Wild West Hacking Fest, way west. Yes, way you west. will. Yes, you will. What I am know. I talking about there? <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> all right thank all you. right everyone thank you thank you yes thank you thank you everyone for showing up and, and being with us we love our time with you during the week and we'll see you next time bye